approach God. And you can approach God with boldness and confidence, not arrogance, not hubris, but with confidence, with boldness, because he's your heavenly father, and you are his child forever. And for that reason, in the same way the child runs to his father with his arms up, you can, with your arms raised towards heaven in worship, go before your heavenly father with boldness, with confidence. Your earthly father may have let you down. He may have even abused you. But your heavenly father is ever loving, is ever gracious, is perfect forevermore. He loves you. And with bold confidence, you can come before your heavenly father and you can do so today. Yes, you. Yes, him. You can go before God the father with bold confidence. This is the message of our text today in Ephesians 3, verse 1 through 13. So on page 977 in the Bibles in the seats with you, and it opens up with a teaching about context. It reminds us that Paul, as he writes this, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, is in prison as he writes. Can we take just a moment to appreciate the way in which Paul did hard time? Because it's pretty amazing. Like, can you just take a minute to appreciate the way in which Paul viewed his own imprisonment? Because some of you likewise, some of you likewise are in chains. Some of you likewise are in prison. When I say prison, I'm not talking about one that you constructed for yourself. I'm not talking about the negative consequences, foolish actions taken. I'm talking about circumstances that have befallen you that are beyond your control. I'm talking about your unjust loss of custody. I'm talking about your cancer. I'm talking about your bereavement. I'm talking about your impairment, your disease, your prison, your loss that is beyond your control. Is it possible, is it possible, in light of the way that Paul viewed his own imprisonment, that you've had completely wrong view of your own prison, your own circumstances that are beyond your control. Take a look at the way that Paul conducted himself while in prison. The, the closing words of the book of Acts tell a beautiful story. Paul had this habit. They would chain him to prison guards, and then those prison guards would often become Christians. He evangelized the people that, that, that imprisoned him. You see, you see that in Acts chapter 16. The jailer who's tasked with overseeing them comes to faith in Christ. Paul and Silas and company are worshiping, literally worshiping the walls down. <laughs> God causes the, the doors to swing open and the walls to fall down in the prison. And the, the, the jailer gives his life to Christ that night and his whole family is saved and baptized. Here, here are the closing words of the book of Acts. Just watch the way that, look, look at the way that Paul views his imprisonment. And look at the way that Paul speaks to his fellow Jews about his ministry to the Gentiles. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier that guarded him. That guard's going to become a Christian before long. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason... Therefore, I've asked to see you and to speak with you since it is because of the hope of Israel that I'm wearing this chain. And they said to him, we have received no letters from Judea about you. And none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken anything evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For with regard to this sect, referring to Christianity, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. If you're a discouraged evangelist, would you look at verse 24? And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. Some of you like, that was all you needed to hear today. That was like the whole sermon for you. <laughs> Paul the apostle himself, inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? Some believed, others didn't. 
And in either case, Paul was obedient to his calling, wasn't he? And disagreeing, disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying that your fathers, through Isaiah the prophet, speaking to largely a Jewish audience, remember, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear but never understand you will indeed see but never perceive, for this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes have been closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and in turn I would heal them. Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. What's so striking to me about the last two words of the book of Acts is that he's physically chained, yet he's without hindrance. Is it possible that you've had the wrong view of your chains, of your imprisonment? Would you consider the number of people who were ministered to by being in proximity to Paul, within earshot of Paul, while he spoke, how many people, just get an estimate in your mind, how many people do you think heard Paul preach in Paul's lifetime? Get that figure in your mind. An estimate of the number of people who just physically heard Paul preach. Now, how many people read the letters that Paul wrote while he was in prison? Knowing that they're all Collected here in the best-selling book of all time by devastating margins in every conceivable market. Is it possible that you're viewing your chains the wrong way? Is it possible that God may bring about ministry because of your imprisonment, ministry that could not have otherwise come about, so that you would minister right there in the prison cell and sing your loudest hallelujah because of your chains and look back on what God did through that season and say, that could not have come about were it not for my chains, and so I am grateful for them. Only the Christian, only the Christian, there's no other worldview that could account for such beautiful faith and optimism. There's no other promise in any other worldview that God would work all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That is Christianity's, and Christianity's alone, my syncretist friend. With this context, Remembering his chains. Let's read Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan, the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Opening and closing verses of this passage, verses 1 and 13, evoke once again Paul's imprisonment. Verse 13, the final verse, gives us an interesting teaching that we could apply in our social media age in unique ways that believers past may not have had to. I'm not talking about posts on social media that would evoke empathy and motivate you to give to a GoFundMe account, to reach out to somebody who is afflicted, to reach out to somebody who is in need. I'm talking about the kind of surrogate secondhand drama that you pick up by reading something else on social media that has nothing to do with you but causes you genuine angst. Do you know what I'm talking about? 
Right? Do you see Paul, Paul ministering to the church at Ephesus saying, like, don't be discouraged by my chains. Don't, I don't want you to be discouraged because of what I'm facing. Do you remember what Paul said? The resurrected Jesus, rather, said to Peter and John. In John chapter 20, 21, the closing chapters of the Gospel of John, he speaks to Peter about John. What is it to you, Peter, if John lives forever? I've got a unique will for you. You walk out what I've called you to walk out. John will live out what John lives out. What is it to you if John never dies? So protect your heart from surrogate drama, secondhand drama that you can pick up by scrolling through social media. By all means, be motivated by the Spirit unto empathy to give where it's necessary. But don't, don't be discouraged because of somebody else's trial. You've got your own cup to drink, amen? Now, the, this is all framed by Paul's imprisonment, and this is a theme that will help you interpret Paul's other prison epistles. The other prison epistles are Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. All right, look at, um, look, look at some of these other references to Paul's imprisonment throughout the prison epistles, as they're called. The word epistle means letter. You can see how he refers to his own chains, of course, here in Ephesians, the book we're currently studying talks about this in Philippians. Philippians is interesting because the theme throughout it, the ubiquitous theme throughout Philippians is just joy, inexplicable and glorious joy. Colossians, likewise, he's in prison. Philemon, likewise, he's in prison. And he talks about his chains. He uses his imprisonment as a ministry platform. Do you see this? He does this repeatedly in his writings. And he's doing it here in the book of Ephesians. The opening words of this passage we just studied are for this reason. If you weren't with us last weekend, go to highlandcc.org and look at our sermon on chapter 2, the closing of, sermon, uh, of chapter 2, because he's speaking about this dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile, which is God's will that that wall be torn down through the work of Christ so that Jew and Gentile alike will be built into a new temple whose cornerstone is Jesus. That's the message of chapter 2, and he says, for this reason, for this reason, in verse 1, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written briefly. Paul, because of this testimony, because of this ministry to the Gentiles, because he was the consummate Jew of utmost pedigree and education and impeccable standards as a Pharisee, the ultimate Jewish authority is reaching out to Gentiles. This gets him in tremendous legal trouble. That's the reason for his chains. That's why he refers to himself as a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. It is for his ministry to the Gentiles that he's been put in jail. And it's from that jail that he writes to us these words. Do you see the word mystery come up twice in verse 3? What does he mean by mystery? How the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I've written briefly. Here's again verse 4. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. I've got to get this dad bod in check. So I try to run when I can. My parents live in Pensacola, Florida, and when we're there, especially for like a holiday, for like Thanksgiving or something, and I know I'm about to take in a whole lot more, you know, like dad bod reinforcements, <laughs> try to offset that by running. My parents have like this ranch style house with a pasture in the front, a pasture in the back, but there's a fence that runs the whole length of the property, and it's shared with a big, giant, square mile, grassy flying field where helicopter pilots are trained. And so my whole life I grew up with this, this breakfast nook with a bay window overlooking this square mile flying field. You could see the perfect sunrise. It was incredible. When I was there recently, I knew that I had to do some running, and I looked at this flying field, and something dawned on me regarding the app on my phone that I used to keep track of my anti-dad bod campaigns. Something that tracks where you run with GPS. And it'll draw out the path that you take as you run. Because it'll drop these little markers along your path with GPS. And so when you run in Seattle, you can see like what streets you took, what sidewalks you took, what yards you ran through, the stop you took at the donut shop. 
but with a big giant grass field, the canvas. You see what you see what I saw? I was like, I could write anything. <laughs> At any given moment, I always have a handful of people who are far from God, and I'm trying to lead them to Christ, and they're trying to lead me away from Christ. We're each trying to proselytize one another. Right, among these are Mormons and atheists, some of whom are mad at me, and I'm like, why are you mad? You don't have a reason. You don't have a reason for anything, <laughs> which makes them matter. <laughs> and there was one of my friends who was like, I'm so fed up with this book, I can't, I don't want to, I was, I was like, do you just read one verse? It's like, no, I'm not going to even read one verse. So I thought about him, and I realized, like, if I, if I wrote out Romans 10, 9, you know, like, if I wrote it out with my jogging path in this field, like, he'd have to read it. And so I hopped the fence and, I, and I, found, I picked out a fence post that was like, okay, this is going to be my baseline, okay? And I, I don't know exactly how far I can run. I don't know what this is going to look like, really, so I've got to make them pretty tall. I'll bet it's going to take me about a mile and a half to, like, write this thing out. And so, picking my spot, tracking my motion with GPS on my app, I was going to take a screenshot of whatever I drew with my running path in the field and then send that to my friend. So I picked my bottom line, I wrote out the R, go up, we arc around, we come down again at an angle. I'm like, okay, first letter is done. I just now realized it's all going to have to be underlined. It's all right. Draw my O, move on. At this point, I've already run a mile. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for the M. There are two ways to draw an M, the bottom. Top, to the bottom again, back up, top again, back down to the bottom. Or you can go from the bottom to the top and down a little bit and then back up to the top <laughs> and back down to the bottom. I chose that M. Don't judge me! <laughs> then came the A. Things went pretty well, but I had begun to lose track of what, which fence post was my bottom line. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm pretty sure these letters are going to begin to veer a little bit. That's okay. All right, the N came, the S came. I think I did the tail of the letter S pretty well, I think, I think, I don't really know. And then it's time to write Romans 10, 9. Okay, so I drew, I ran up vertically. I, I don't think I ran quite far enough to make a little hat on the one. The 10 came up, the 10 came out pretty clearly, and then I had to stop for a second. Oh, I have to, I have to like draw out a colon. <laughs> because like Romans 109 is useless. There's... There are not 109 chapters in Romans. I'm going to send this to my, my skeptical friend, and he's going to be like, this is dumb. <laughs> so I had to figure out, okay, this, it can't be in my baseline. I don't even know where my baseline is, but it, um, it's somewhere around here, and so I've got to run up a little ways, and I've got to draw a big circle with my jogging path, and then I've got to go back up a little bit further and then do it again, and I'm at the top of, my, the, the, top of the, the, the two dots that were my colon, and then I realized I don't want to, like, Ruin it by running back down through it again. So I had to do something like this. <laughs> right? And so I finished that, and then it came to time to draw the nine. And I don't know if I had enough energy to do the little tail. You know the curvilinear tail that you can use when you draw out a nine? I don't know if it really came through clearly. But in any, in any case, here is the result. <laughs> this is what I sent to... <laughs> you can see the short dip on the M. <laughs> My S is like ever some sort of weird pagan symbol. And then like all the running for the colon was meaningless. <laughs> So it's supposed to say Romans 10, 9. And so I was sure to clarify that. I was like, it took me three and a half miles to write this for you. So you better look it up. And he did. <laughs> yeah. So after I was done, I stopped there for a moment and took a screenshot of my best effort. And then I remembered something else. The, uh, the fence that's adjacent to the fence that my parents' property line runs along is shared with big, busy, four-lane highway. 
which means that in the 40 or so minutes it took me to, to write this, several hundred people could see me. <laughs> and I thought for a minute about, I tried to picture what they saw. Can you, can you picture, especially when I was doing like the colon, they ended up just being like a spike. Like, like driving, oh, hun, that's sad. <laughs> just some random dude. Running around, laughing, <laughs> stopping and putting his hands on his knees and then acting like something's chasing him. <laughs> Honey, he probably thinks something's chasing him. Because they saw it from, they saw it from literally an earthly perspective, right? They're on the same earth that I am, from the earthly angle, from the earthly perspective. I'm on the earth, they're on the earth, both on the same earth. And from that perspective, they just see some random dude with a shirt on his head just running in random patterns, stopping and starting and laughing maniacally. But if they had seen it from heaven's perspective, it would have said Romans 10, 9, sort of. It would have said reference to a Bible verse that is the gospel. If they look at it from heaven's view, literally, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I was striving and I was running so that I could get my atheist friend just to read this Bible verse. And he did. And he's saved. And it made no sense to the people who saw it from the earthly perspective. This mystery of the gospel didn't make sense from the earthly view. It didn't make sense that Paul would be imprisoned. His, right, his rights as a Roman were violated. It didn't make sense from the earthly view. But if you could see your trial, you could see the gospel written out, you could see the mystery that began with its roots deep in the book of Genesis, the whole Old Testament law, serving as the foundation, the mystery now revealed. It's a story of the gospel of Jesus Christ from heaven's view. Do not be confounded by the mysteries that assail here in this age. Aspire to view things from heaven's view because it is all the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. Come to the next verse with me. In verse 5 he writes, It was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Whole generations had gone by with this mystery unknown. Are you wondering what in the world God is doing right now in your life? Where, God, where are you in this? I can relate to that, Jesse. I've got a few mysteries of my own. But for perspective, can we step out Bible-wide and appreciate how patient our ancestors in Yahweh have been in generations past? How privileged we are to live when we live so that we have the full canon of Scripture collected, the full mystery of the gospel made known, and the Messiah's name, Jesus, in our hearts. Because most of the believers in, in generations past didn't know that name and wanted to. For perspective, consider the length of time that people have waited for various things. Take a look at these timelines. Consider the prophecies about Messiah's birth from the close of the book of Malachi to the events of the opening of the Gospels, from the prophecy about the Messiah, the prophecies about the Messiah at the end of, the Mal uh, end of Malachi, and then the actual birth of Christ, right, the announcement from Gabriel to tell the news in the name of Jesus, and the miraculous proclamation with John the Baptist in his mother's womb, knowing he was in proximity to Jesus in his mother's womb, you know how long people waited? 400 years. So to scale, here is some perspective. Per unit, the top line represents 400 years. That's how long people waited between the close of Malachi and the opening events of the Gospels. Compare this to the number of years it has been since the signing of the Declaration of Independence. When you think back to how long ago that was, it feels like ancient history, right? This is how long it is compared to the amount of time people waited for the messianic prophecies about his birth to come realized. This is how long people spent in the, what's called the intertestamental period. 
this prophetic silence from God from the close of Malachi to the opening of the Gospels. Compare that to the full history of the U.S. so far. Compare that to how long the automobile has existed. There are multiple points from which to chart that. I chose in 1885 in which Benz built the first gasoline-powered car. Now, compare that to how long Grandma's been alive. Okay, if Grandma was 100 years old, we'd preach this at the 8 a.m. service, and there were some people who related more to this timeline. <laughs> now, compare this to about 20 years, just for perspective, for scale. Some of you are this age, some of you are a few years older, but either way, have you been waiting for 20 years for God to make a mystery known in your life? Have you been waiting 20 years for a prayer to be answered? Have you been waiting on God? Is it possible that you're just being impatient? Because God's not slow in keeping his promises the way that some understand slowness. He's patient with us. Consider the 400 years that people waited just for that one prophecy to be fulfilled. And consider how privileged you are just to have been born when you were born. That you would know the name of the Messiah. Most believers in generations past would step into glory with the tension unresolved. Believing in faith that the promises would be fulfilled. And look at how blessed we are that the mystery's been made known. Because it wasn't known for generation upon generation upon generation. This is what Paul is describing. It wasn't made known to generations past, but now, through holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, the mystery has been made known. Look at verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles, that's non-Jewish peoples, are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Can you imagine coming downstairs one day, sitting at the breakfast table, and there are your parents, and then there's some other kid that you've never seen before, and he calls your father dad. Who is this? This is what it was like for the Jewish people to hear news that now the Gentiles are fellow heirs. Can you, can you imagine how they may have struggled with that? Wait a minute, like, he was worshiping the sun like a month ago. I've held fast to dietary law from the Old Testament my whole life. And now he and I are both co-heirs? We are both on equal standing before God? Yes. Can you see why these words, the book of Ephesians, is inflammatory to Orthodox Jews? That the Gentiles are co-heirs before God. Continue in the text with me. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. Paul takes no credit for the power that is at work in his ministry and in his life. He knows that 100% of the glory goes to God and God alone. If you're ever bored on a weekend, you can go online, you can take a quiz, and you can become an ordained minister. You can actually buy legal performativity. You can actually purchase from some website built by people who probably don't believe in God an ordination. So if you're ever bored, there's something you could do. Those people are geniuses. Genii? Genii. Because they don't even believe in God, but they're selling this commodity. Their obsolescence? Nil. Their shipping costs? Nil. Production costs, nothing. But you're going to pay for it anyway. And they don't even believe in it. But it's fully legally salient. Well, you could purchase this thing and go officiate a wedding. So if you're looking for a slightly pagan business idea, it's like, I, I, I wish you could do the same thing as a cop. <laughs> From some online governing body who doesn't carry any legal weight, like just purchase your own badge and print it and pull people over. <laughs> Paul acknowledges that he was made into this minister. And this was by the grace of God, and this was by God's power that all this has happened. You can see more of a, about this in Acts chapter 9. If you want to read the story about how Paul the Apostle, who went by his more Hebrew name at first, Saul of Tarsus, was about the business of persecuting the church, and then he met the resurrected Jesus. It's a powerful story. He was God's chosen instrument to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. He was made into a minister. He takes no credit for what God has accomplished through him. Verse 8, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, it's because he was overseeing the first martyrdom of the New Testament. 
That's why he believes himself to be the least deserving. The least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. You want to know what that mystery is? It's this. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And whoever believes in him would not die but have everlasting life. That's John 3.16. Romans 3.23, here's the mystery made known. Look at how privileged we are. That all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we may be justified freely by his grace. Romans 6.23 says that, all, that the wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The mystery made known. John 14.6, Jesus himself answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. As we read a text that describes coming to the Father with bold confidence, the only way that's possible is through Jesus, and it's Jesus himself who said that. This is the mystery made known. Look at the word manifold in verse 10, because that can be tricky, right? So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be now made known to rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This word manifold can be confusing because it, it, it's also a noun in the English language. The NASB, the NIV, ESV, the King James, the New King James all render it manifold. The CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, offers a synonym, multifaceted. And these are good translations of the same Greek word that does describe the multifaceted love of God. In the context of Ephesians 3, it's love that is not just directed toward the Jew, but is also toward the Gentile, toward every nation. It's a beautiful teaching. It's a beautiful thought. Because here we sit in a crowd mostly of Gentiles. And here I am, a card-carrying Native American whose people were on the opposite side of the planet, like we didn't know about any of this stuff at the time. And now, because of the manifold wisdom of God that's been made known, we're talking about it. Isn't that beautiful? The, word, the love of God, this wisdom of God is made known. This multifaceted, manifold wisdom of God is made known through what means? Look at verse 10. What is the institution? What is the voice? What is the means by which this wisdom is made known? The church. It's you. And there's no backup plan. You understand? It's through you that this manifold wisdom will be made known. And remember ever the contents of verse 10. That... This is a spiritual war that is taking place. This is a spiritual battle that takes place. All right, the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he, was, that was, that, that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. At 3, 10 p.m., every weekday afternoon, at Maplewood Heights Elementary School, there is a savage ritual that takes place. You drive your car into the side entrance, being sure not to squish a little person as you do. And you come out and you wait before the fence for these sturdy metal doors, and it's a good thing too, for the release of the kindergartners. <laughs> and it is violent. As it is adorable. And then when the time comes, this poor teacher whose job I do not covet at all <laughs> opens the doors and the cute little savages burst forth. And this poor teacher has to make sure that the right kid goes to the right parent. I was there. And I survived, <laughs> only because of the chain link fence that was behind me. I saw a mohawk making its way up through the crowd. That was my little savage, Ace. And I knew he was not going to slow down and wait for me to put my phone in my pocket, so I had to snap a picture. I had like a split nanosecond to do it. But I wanted to capture what it looks like to approach the Father with bold confidence. And here it is. This is what it looks like <laughs> to approach the Father with bold confidence. I couldn't even get the mohawk in the picture because I had like a split second to take it and then <laughs> capture the picture and then capture him. Now, why is he confident? Why is he bold? Articulate the reasons why. 
because he knows that his father loves him. This is why he does what he does. My skeptical friend, does it now make a little bit more sense why Christians will raise their hands and worship to a God whom you cannot see? And you know they can't either. But with bold confidence, they raise their hands just like the kindergartners running to mom and dad. Because they know that they are loved. They know that they belong. They know that they haven't earned this. They know that it's just because, just because they're their father's children, they could run up with arms high. This is the kind of bold confidence that I believe Ephesians 3 is describing. And this is the kind of bold confidence that I want you to have as we likewise, with hands raised towards heaven, we reach up to our Father. Some of you for the very first time right here and now. This mystery has roots deep in the book of Genesis. It wasn't known to most generations of believers until now. Now it is made known in part and thanks to the ministry of Paul which continues today, not because his voice lingers, its echoes have long since faded, but because the writing remains, because it was written from a jail cell, the man sat still long enough to inscribe something that we would read today. Are you grateful now for the imprisonment of Paul? Would we enact this text here and now, some of you for the very first time, by with bold confidence, the grace afforded us through Jesus Christ. You lift your hands to your heavenly Father for the very first time. Let's go before God in prayer, and then you'll have the chance to take communion as a believer for the very first time. How amazing is that? So, with your hands lifted towards your heavenly Father, if God's calling you and adopting you today, or if you're a Christian, you just want to reach your arms up to your Father, would you just do it now with me? God, I believe that you love the world so much that you gave your one and only Son, that if I would believe in him, I would not die but have everlasting life. With bold confidence, I confess to you that I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God, I confess to you that the wages of my sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. With bold confidence, I know and I proclaim my agreement with Jesus, that Jesus alone is the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. And so filled with the Holy Spirit of God, I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Highlands Community Church, would you say Jesus is Lord? Say it. Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart, oh God, you raised Jesus from the dead. Now God, let me be saved. Let me be saved. Let me be saved. With bold confidence, I reach my hands up to my Heavenly Father, knowing that he will embrace me, not because of anything that I've done, but just because of the grace afforded through Jesus. Because I'm his child, with assurance, I can approach the Father. Thank you for the grace. Thank you for making the mystery of the gospel known.